because I only started talking to Steve, I guess, uh, two weeks ago about the possibility of coming up. So uh, thank you, everyone, for taking the time to come out here. Um, so I'm Paul Jackson. I manage this program, as well as about $240 million of other active awards that the Third Frontier has given out in the last, uh, I guess, the oldest one I have right now is from 2007. Uh, the I've only been with Third Frontier for about three years. Prior to that, I was a reviewer for the Third Frontier uh, from the National Academies. I ran proposal reviews, so I'm actually very familiar with uh, with the Crystal Institute and uh, Kent Displays and Alpha Micron and a lot of the technologies that Kent has tried to or has successfully commercialized through Third Frontier programs. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, so recently I changed the TVSF program a little bit, and that's. One of the big reasons why I wanted to come up, but also it's been, uh, I think, almost two years since I was last up here to talk about TBSF, and it's undergone other changes in the meantime, and so I wanted to make sure that everyone knew what those, knew how the program operates so that you can uh, apply in June or, or in October. So, okay. so overall, the point of TBSF is to help transition technology that's been developed at an Ohio research institution uh, out into the marketplace through startup companies. If it's something that, if it's a technology that would be best served uh, being licensed to Honda or some other major strategic, it doesn't fit this program. It's really about technologies that don't fit there, that need a startup vehicle to go forward. Um, and then, of course, create economic growth and jobs in Ohio because that's what we do is economic growth. So there's now three, three different ways to approach the program. There's phase one, track A, phase one, track B, phase two. And understand, I'm not allowed to create new programs, otherwise I would have three different programs here and it would be much simpler. Uh, so everything's contained confusingly in one RFP, but yes, I have three different ways of engaging on the program. Uh, an application to track B precludes an institution from applying to any, any track A projects. So, if the institution, Kent State, decides that track B makes sense for it, there should be no track A proposals coming forward for that round or for the future. And I'll explain what these things mean um, as we go. So phase one track A is what we've always called phase one. It's a specific project for a technology that's been developed at, at, at Kent uh, and needs additional validation or proof before an Ohio startup company can license the technology. So this is developing the alpha. You, you have something that you know works. You've published on it, but you don't have the alpha prototype, or you don't. You, you're not sure that it's going to work in a commercial way. And an entrepreneur says, "Well, if you can do X, Y, or Z, then I'd be interested in licensing the technology." The point of this funding is to do X, Y, or Z. Um, the goal, though, is not to fund the PI in the lab. It's to fund outside providers. So if you have to build a prototype, it's not for you to build a prototype. It's for at some engineering firm to build a prototype for you. That's the emphasis and the hope. Frequently, institutions have unique capabilities that make it ridiculous to go outside, and we do make exceptions. Uh, the lead applicant for a phase one, uh, track A, is the institution uh, that has the IP rights. The awards, they're up to $50,000 for each, each one. Uh, it has to be matched one to one for each expense by cost share from the institution. Uh, and the end goal of, of, of a track A is a license with a startup company. So when you're creating that proposal, there's milestones. Really, the last milestone should be discussions with a startup company or starting a startup company. Phase one track B is a little bit different. Uh, you could think of this as a block grant. So it's a the intent here is for the institution to create a pool of funds that represents a strategic decision to <coughs> commercialize technology developed at the institution. Rather than trying to find cost share for each individual project that, that makes sense coming into track A, this is setting up a large fund at the front end and then establishing a process to pick uh, what technologies fit uh, going forward. Uh, the, there's all sorts of fun rules in the RFP about how that process has to be. I try to keep it as general as possible because I don't know what makes sense for each institution. So it's a little bit of an experiment because I know already that Case Western and OSU are both going to come in on, on track B and both have very different ways of doing it. Cleveland Clinic wants to come in too and they have yet another different way of doing it. And so there's a lot of variety. And it's, it's flavored by the specific needs of the institution. At least that's my hope. Uh, the awards, 
are two hundred to five hundred thousand dollars. So there is a, a minimum level that the, that, has to, that you have to come in at. Uh, it has to be matched one to one uh, with cost share from the institution. This is not uh, each expense of the projects. This is the fund itself needs to be created at a one to one. So I believe Kent has issues with the party to sue requirement on track A. I believe uh, there is no party to sue requirement on track A. But it's a cash match. It's a cash match. <laughs> Can that be uh, uh, external? So, sorry. I was just saying, but maybe Lori can. Uh, uh, people won't necessarily know what that means. The Perry Passu? Yes. One, so two. I think the idea of the way that the current program has been running with the um, Perry Passu terminology is that basically every expenditure is split 50 50. So you buy a pencil, not sure that would be an allowable expense, but you buy a pencil, it would be funded half by the grant funds, half by the cost share fund. Um, or you have a graduate assistant appointed half from the grant funds, half from the Kent State cost share funds and down the line everything that goes through. So the uh, cash the sh shale, um, can that be, um, uh, can the external funding uh, be used as shale? So from a, from a third party, from another, yeah, another NIH, party? NIH, NSF, that sort of thing. That can complicate things. If the, <laughs> if the money is, cut already, is already awarded to Kent and you have the discretion to divert it in that way, then it should be okay. But if it's specific to a project, then it's going to be very problematic for us because we're not going to know that you're really going to be able to deploy the money. Um, so it gets more complicated the further away you get from the actual cash uh, from the institution. Yeah, I think it could be a bit difficult just because really that means that the projects would need to overlap completely in what yeah. in what they were doing. And then for those same funds, they would essentially be beholden to two different sponsors, um, which would also, I guess it would not necessarily be impossible, but would be very difficult. They would, they would have to really be under, you know, there would have to be a limited number of restrictions, I think, in using those for that to really work. Right. And so really for the track B, the hope is that the institution makes the decision at a fairly high level, you know, a VP of research or above, to go after the school. Uh, at the track A, that's more pro that's a project specific situation where you're trying to find uh, cost share for your specific project. Um, and uh, and that, maybe that's better, maybe it's not better. I'm not sure which one works best for Ken. So part of why I'm up. Um, but so track B gets rid of part of uh, You do have to have cash up front. The idea is to have this big amount of money that will then, you have a committee that will then select uh, what projects should be funded. Uh, it's a one year, one year long grant. Uh, the committee has to be mostly outsiders. You have to bring in people who like Jumpstart or uh, outside VC firm that would actually have interest in funding these things down the line. The idea is it's not just research, it is commercialization. Uh, so the end goal here is numerous licenses of startups. And then there's phase two. And phase two is uh, the ultimate project is an Ohio startup company or young company that's want, that wants to license and commercialize the technology from an Ohio institution. The technology in question does not have to go through track A, uh, through phase one to be a phase two, to be phase two eligible. So it can be something you already have on the shelf that doesn't need any additional validation at this point. Uh, the lead applicant here is actually the company, and the award is up to $100,000 or $150,000 for projects related to biomedical. Uh, there are no cost share requirements on phase two awards. So it is very free money. Uh, it's non dilutive, we don't take equity. Uh, it's really initial capitalization funds that a lot of companies can really use because they're way too early stage for anyone else to put in money. Uh, and too late stage to be appropriate for, uh, federal, for a federal award or something like that. Uh, plus, usually too small. But, uh, the end goal of a phase two is to actually, again, take this technology and do whatever you need to do to then convince downstream investors that, it makes, that it's viable. Um, typically, it's after getting a phase two, you then go and get a pre-seed award through groups like, um, well, Jumpstart runs a pre-seed award. Now Youngstown's going to run one. There's several in the state, or you run it through, uh, you know, something like Queen City Angels. I don't know who else. You have North, North Coast Angel Fund, I think, is up here. Yeah. Um, so that's the the idea. Excuse me. Yes. Is the IP position requirement for for phase two application is that it's attached to the institution or invention or technologies? 
that so I there should be it should be it should be patentable or if it's software it should be uh, copyrightable or somehow protected sometimes we do just just straight trade secrets are okay but these, these technologies do not have to be originated from an institution they need to be from the institution has to own them has to own the IP and then before we can execute our award with the company they need to sign an exclusive license license agreement with the institution it, it can be exclusive just to the to the fields of use but it does have to be exclusive within that within that what if the IP is owned by both the university and the, the, the company? The, that is jointly owned? Jointly owned. That will be uh, an odd situation that we don't normally see. And so that would be a phone call with me or an email with me uh, to discuss whether or not it makes sense. A key point of the, the idea of the phase two award <coughs> is that, this, that these technologies aren't quite ready for an entrepreneur or a company to take. And so this award is a hook to get them to take the technology because it's free money to do whatever work needs to be done on the, on the technology. And there's restrictions on how the money can be spent. It can't actually go to the entrepreneur or small company in terms of personnel time. It has to go towards advancing the technology through hiring contractors, buying supplies, buying equipment, actually setting up a pilot production facility or something to that effect. If you could do it for $100,000, that, that, that would be an allowable cost. Uh, in fact, we just did an award for that in uh, Worcester, based on uh, Wayule rubber. Uh, they have to do a pilot run. In order to do that, they have to buy some equipment, and that's really what the, what the fund is for. Is this one also, it's, it's through an RFP process, or is this more of uh, a regular schedule, you do an RFP? Yep. And, and how, how many have you funded phase two, and, and what proportion of applications get funded? Just curiosity. Right. So within phase two, I want to say I have about <coughs> 55 or so that I funded, um, in the, the, the program's funded over the last four years. Um, compare that with probably mid-70s or 80 uh, phase ones. Um, overall applications to the program, I think we're running at about a 30% approval rate, but then it gets a little complicated because there's resubmissions, and so I would have to actually do some, <coughs> some fun math there. But it's somewhat comparable phase one versus phase two in terms of percent. Yes, it, it's very similar in terms of for the recommendations. Um, yes. And if you submit uh, and don't get it the first time, uh, you have a much higher uh, probability of getting it on a second submission. Actually, require a debrief call between you and the evaluator if you don't get recommended so that you fully understand because reading evaluator reports, sometimes it's not clear what it is that they're talking about. I want to make sure that applicants can talk to them specifically and get the right people. You see, yeah, the, the, related to phase 1A and B, uh, uh, if your chance, uh, if phase, one, you, phase 1B, the institution either gets a chunk of money or it gets nothing. Yes. If uh, 1A, you, if you submit up to six, you have some probability that some percentage of those six will get funded. Yes. So it's, uh, and I don't know what, uh, Phase, phase 1B is new, correct? Yes. It's the yes. first time, and so you, you can't really speak to the percentile. And, but uh, obviously, uh, you know, a smaller institution like this one might have to be competing with Case Western. But you're not competing against them. You are competing against the criteria of the RFP. So it's, it is a, it's a competitive program, but you're not, it's, it's, we're not restricted in that we only have so much money to go to so many institutions, and you might be just off the line. If you meet the requirements, we'll do everything we can to make sure that you get your share of the pot. But you mentioned fund requirements. Well, yeah, we have to go places and look for that magic fund. Yeah. Uh, and I have, I have a lot of interest in making sure the track B's work. Long term, I'd like to turn off track A because it's just too many projects for me to manage. Uh, and it's not running very effectively. Very few of them are converting over. Uh, the review team that looks at them, they don't have the right context to be able to figure out which ones are really going to transform into licenses and which ones aren't. And so that's why it's a big reason why I want to move everyone into the track B. So I've also been very open to helping, not helping, uh, discussing particulars about uh, track B proposals. I'm not going to write it for you, but I will engage with you enough that uh, it will almost guarantee that you get an interview uh, with the review team. Um, because that, to make sure you're in um, line with the spirit of program. I guess maybe it's in other third frontier programs that at least historically have been including clinic would receive a certain amount of money per year towards product development. Right? And they would, with a similar kind of match, is that still going on? 
Uh, that would be a that'd be an older program. Is that, uh, is that ended? I'm pretty sure that's not yeah not not running anymore. I mean, we still have GCIC still is an active an active award. No, yeah, that, um, that's yeah, that's and, that's a spinoff of the the big award. I was one of the directors that, but they they used to also separately get I think half a million dollars a year or something from the third frontier to then be used this way where you make the decisions internally about what you're going to support. So they do have a pre-seed fund, which is very similar to that. Um, it's a little bit further downstream than what TBSF is looking at in terms of the development of the technology. Okay. Um, but that, and that program still does exist. Okay. Um, yes. So this is my yeah. attempt to be creative. Uh, so visually speaking, in the lab you create something. The point of phase one is to turn it into, some, into the, the more real version that you can demonstrate to an entrepreneur. The point of phase two is that for the entrepreneur to take it and then turn it into something that they can then, it's more mm -hmm. exciting that they can get funded or uh, go to market with. Uh, and by phase one, I mean phase one A or B because the, the, the idea behind the individual projects that get funded on the track B is that they're similar in scope uh, for the purpose as a, as a track A. Um, the hope is that there's more flexibility on track B because then you don't have to submit a big proposal to us for 50000 because everyone wants $50,000 uh, to do the, to do it and it has to go <coughs> twice a year and it takes months to process and sign the award. We get away from all of that with the track B. That's the intent, is to make it easier for the institutions to commercialize. So some admin and process points. Uh, so the tech transfer office acts as a gatekeeper for both phases. Uh, a signed letter has to accompany any proposal that comes in, uh, attesting to the, you know, that the project was selected and that there's merit behind it, and there's a discussion with the tech transfer office that it's going to go forward as a commercialization effort. Uh, no more than six track A's from an institution in a given cycle. And again, if you apply for track A's, you can't apply for track B in the same cycle. And if you, get a, if you get a track B, you wouldn't be able to apply for track A's anymore because everything should be running through your track B funding. Uh, the proposals are uh, what I call simple, and that's in comparison to other third frontier programs, uh, especially in the past. Uh, it's just the form of uh, answers to a set of questions, around 10 questions for each, each one of the applications. Uh, and they, the narrative answering those questions can't exceed six pages in length. And that even applies for track B, and keeping it nice and simple. Uh, proposals are submitted through an online portal now, which took a very long time to get set up and is terrible, but it works mostly. Uh, <laughs> if you submit it there and you don't get a confirmation, definitely send me an email. So then uh, in the current RFP, we've got two cycles. One is uh, June 23rd, uh, which is the next due date, and then I believe the one after that is something like October 20th or something to that effect. Uh, the awards usually <coughs> happen a few months after you submit. Uh, so the June 23rd proposal submissions should be voted on at the commission's retreat in September. And then it takes about a month after that for controlling board, and then now it takes uh, a week and a half after controlling board before it can be So if you go track B, for how long are you precluded to go in the track? I don't know how long this program is slated. Right, so track A is supposed to be a one-year uh, one period, uh, and so you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to apply for track A's during that time. And it, we're not going to do extensions on the track fees. The idea is that you set up a fund <coughs> based on what deal flow you think you can reasonably do in the year, and then it runs probably about three months before it ends. That will be the next submission date, for, or it will be, be a submission date, and you can submit sort of a renewal of, of the award, but it will be standalone as a, it will be a different award. Uh, the intent being, okay, you only did three projects when you thought you were going to do ten. So maybe the renewal is not the full amount, it's a smaller amount, or maybe it was only three because it took a long time to get started up and now you've got a real pipeline developed. You know, there's, the intent is to be more, to allow a lot more variation and a lot more discussion about what, what, what's So it wouldn't carry forward to year two. Right. It would, it would just, it would end. It would end. You get your cost share back and we get our money back that you didn't spend. Uh, there is a, very confusing part of the RFP about i Ohio. So if you go through the i Ohio program, you have a lessened cost share requirement. Instead of 50,000 being matched by 50,000 on track A, or half the project being matched by cost share with Kermars in the track B, if you're not selected, uh, it's a three to one ratio. 
So it's 25K of cost share to 75K of uh, uh, Third Frontier funds. Same thing on track B. Uh, the intent here is to incentivize everyone to apply for iCourt Ohio because really the technologies going through there are really well situated typically to go into track A, to go into phase one following going through iCourt. So when you say you get your cost share back, literally the money is actually sent to the state, that the, let's say it's a $200,000 award for track B, you would expect $200,000 sent to the state or we just say here's the account that we're going to be using? You'll, you'll have the account that you'll be using. So, so and just, then, it'd just be freed up if, if it wasn't spent. Right, you'll be freed up. Yeah. Uh, and we, we intend on running it sort of like the pre-seed award, and I don't know if you're familiar with those very much, but uh, what it would mean is you have a committee that selects the, pro selects the projects, and then you send a letter to me, uh, one page for each one of those projects. It says, this is, you know, here's what their general budget, milestones, technology, description, and then I say, okay, uh, and then we release the funds. And so it's side by side, you have immediate access to the Thrift Frontier funds. It's not reimbursement based like all the other uh, at the end, we have to do some accounting to make sure that all the money is spent, or, but uh, it's very different. So uh, we don't do interviews for track A's. We do interviews for track B's and phase twos. The track A's are too small of awards for us to, to make for it to make sense for the evaluation team to meet with everyone. So they make a best guess, and then, like I said, if you don't get recommended. You have to do a debrief call, and then hopefully there's sort of a mini interview where you can find out really more detail about what you need to do to be able to come forward again. Any questions before I jump into some exciting high-level comments? Okay. Uh, so the review team has no specific metrics to hit in terms of what they're approving or recommending for awards. They're not looking for five from northeast and three from southwest. It's nothing like that. It's if a project meets the requirements of the RFP, they're going to recommend it for award. Uh, for this year, in, in this RFP, I have $5 million for the program. I've never actually spent $5 million for the program. Uh, so my hope is that uh, it will be sufficient. If it's not sufficient after the first round, I'll go back to the Third Frontier Commission and specifically ask them for more money so that everyone can get funded and I expect no problems there. Uh, because they're very, this is one of our few programs that we have left. We only have about five programs. And if we had that much interest in the program, they would be interested in increasing the amount of money. Uh, and uh, they've done that in the past. Uh, the review team is a mix of technical folks and business reviewers. So it's not just is the technology great, it's also is there commercial potential? Is there a business that can be founded around this? Uh, phase one proposal is nice and fuzzy about the business case. A phase two proposal, there needs to be a business plan already in. Yeah. So it, it, it just gets more clear that there's a business case. Uh, but the, <laughs> they make me say this every time. Uh, they're only able to assess what's in the proposal. Uh, and they give the benefit of the doubt where appropriate. But frequently, um, the, the thing that they most cite is that the, the discussion about the technical, the technical side of the, of the proposal, the, it's not clear that the proof of concept has been established or it's not clear what the actual end goal of the project is going to be. Uh, whether that's to optimize it by whatever percent or, or do whatever it is, frequently that piece gets missed and those projects don't get funded. Uh, it's very much a pro it's project funding. It's not general support for doing cool stuff, which is great that you do, but it is take this technology, move it forward, and commercialize it. Uh, proposals that aren't recommended are there, it, there's usually some, uh, either more work has to be done or uh, the information has to be presented in a different way that the evaluators actually understand what it is that you're actually proposing. Uh, they aren't uh, kicked out for trivial issues. You exceeded the proposal length by one page. I'm much nicer than the fence. I actually contact you immediately after you submit and say, hey, you have seven pages. You have probably two days, but get back to me with six page proposal instead. Uh, or you're missing your letter of support from your tech transfer office. Rather than just kicking you out, I say, okay, go get it right now. And then get it back to me probably within two days. Uh, so I'm, I'm somewhat nice. Uh, the, <laughs> so, uh, but they aren't kicked out for trivia issues. Really, it's, it, unless it's outside the program guidelines. Um, but the, any, any, anything that's not recommended, typically the evaluators can point to some particular thing or set of things 
as to why it doesn't fit the program. You mentioned that the, the proposal itself is strongly directed by the fact you're answering specific questions. Yes. I should think those questions would include the things that you say are missing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and, and, it's, and at least word of mouth, and I'm new here, but the, some of the ones from Kent State in the past have been turned down because they're quote, too early. Mm -hmm. And so um, hopefully those questions would be suggestive of, of what stage it really needs to be in. I've, I've, I tweet the questions. Um, every, every time I release the RFP, if you've seen this program over the years, you, you've seen it change every time I release the RFP. Um, trying, trying to address problems the evaluators see, trying to, to deal with um, any, any concerns the institutions have. Um, part of track B honestly <coughs> stemmed from a uh, discussion uh, here uh, because Kent State did not like part of Sue at all. You're not the only ones. Um, and the only, only, the, the only way for us to get around it was really to go this, this, this track B option, which um, was also coming out of several other pieces and discussions. Uh, but I remember that party pursue is a difficult thing, and so we saw this as being a reasonable vehicle for eliminating that part. It was because of cash. You pretty much had to have cash match in order to buy, you know, right. half a pencil or whatever, <laughs> and you couldn't. For example, get the money for a stipend and donate tuition fees for a GA, you know, to have equal, no, it had to be exactly half. Yeah. That was difficult for the departments to deal with or budgeting. We just didn't have, and we didn't have the cash. It's also difficult for us to deal with on the back end. Um, and I'm both glad and sorry that you remember me. <laughs> 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 um, okay. Um, right. Oh, I was actually in the middle of Um, okay. So, other, other comments that I've gotten from the evaluators. Uh, so the questions, I, I do think that I've, I've tweaked them a little bit, uh, this round in particular, to try to get more towards what, what we're looking for. Uh, I also made it easier to fill out the application because you don't have to include the whole question anymore. You can just include the two bolded words, so I gave an extra half page of space to everybody, um, or even more than that. Uh, our questions are a bit long sometimes. Uh, so proposals should try to be objective. Um, doing, if everything's all nice and rosy, um, you probably don't need my money. Uh, so <laughs> there's probably a specific problem that you're trying to address, and there's probably several factors that are preventing you from being able to, to address that problem. Talking about that and saying why you think your approach is going to solve the problems, that's what the evaluators are looking for. You're looking for a reasonable path for the project to go forward. Um, business guidance is critical for both phase one and phase two. Um, phase one, track A, and fa phase two. Um, track B, it's really an institutional decision to go into it. Um, but the going after one of these projects, the ultimate aim is to commercialize technology. So if you don't understand anything about the, the potential commercialization path, you're not going to be uh, on point for, uh, for the details. You're not going to know that this 50% smaller version of your thing is actually going to be commercializable because you haven't talked to anyone yet. So talking to the tech transfer office, talking to actual, cus actual potential customers makes a lot of sense. And this is why I think, uh, why I want i Ohio to be sort of a, a feeder for TVSF because you go out and meet up to 100 customers for your potential technology, and you learn much more specific what you need to do in order to get it to them. Uh, and you know, it's this is an experiment to some extent, the Accord Ohio thing and, and the track B, and we'll see how it goes, and then I'll modify the RFP again here. Uh, so the frequently, um, some technologies are just not good, they don't make a good fit for the program. Uh, we're trying to get viable startup companies at the end date, uh, and uh, so drug development is oftentimes uh, a very difficult thing to try to argue for because typically it's going to require lots of money and lots of time, and there's this big valley of death in between where it is at the university and where it would be as a, as a viable startup company. Uh, if you can make that argument, great. Um, but oftentimes it's going to require you already have a line on 10 million or more of funding down the road and you've set it up real well and you know that this clinical trial is going to do this and it's 
it's much harder to do drug development in this program than many other kinds of technology. We're really trying to set up startup companies. And there are ways of doing a licensing play where you set up a company that's going to then sub-license out. Maybe it's a platform technology and that's just the first use. You're going to use that revenue to then do more exciting stuff um, based on that platform. You can make an argument about that. Uh, we're, we're open to lots of different models. Uh, at least I think we are. Uh, so the track me in phase two interviews, we're only going to be offering them if the gaps the review team sees can be reasonably addressed during the interview. Uh, if there's massive gaps we don't offer in an interview because it just doesn't make sense. It's a waste of time for everyone to drive down to Columbus. Go through our exciting security procedures now where you can't even have a backpack. Um, and uh, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, the <laughs> It doesn't make any sense to have those interviews unless there are reasonable issues that can be resolved. Um, and again, if you don't get funded, we then happily talk to you afterwards to make sure you understand thoroughly why. Uh, yeah. And on the track B, I will be surprised if any institution that, that interacts with me prior to their proposal uh, doesn't get an interview. I'll, I'll be very surprised. Can you even know about the gas? Sometimes the two lines doesn't make sense and no no content to be able to do it. Is that any case that you don't say that you just found it in the way? we have not yet uh, the evaluators have not yet uh, made a recommendation without having an interview. Uh, unless except for the, the track A's. Uh, but there's no there is no interview on the on the track A's. Um, so you should never Never, never think about that in terms of the commission meeting. Um, but if you if you find out the interviews are happening on track B or on phase twos, and your company or your uh, your institution wasn't invited, well, it is theoretically possible for them to recommend, uh, but it is uh, it hasn't happened. What 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 are they looking for? A lot of the interview for, so we've only run interviews on phase two so far, because the track B is new. Um, a lot of that interview is about the business acumen of the team to make sure that, it, that they understand what it is that they're getting into, that there is someone who can take it forward in a, in a meaningful way for, for the business. Uh, if you have someone who doesn't know what a pro forma is, and that, that's the CEO of the company, that gives the interview team a lot of pause about whether or not it's a viable team to carry it forward, especially if the next stage is to raise money, well then there's an issue. Uh, and so it, a lot of it is understanding the business acumen of the team, understanding the team actually understands the technology and that and its commercial application. Uh, we've occasionally seen situations where there's a, an entrepreneur involved who really doesn't understand the technology at all, and the PI, um, not the PI, the researcher from the institution understands the technology thoroughly. Um, but they, they were friends for 20 years and that's why it's going forward, not because the entrepreneur actually has a vision for the company or for the technology. And so it's, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in those interviews. Um, and the tech I transfer office is a way to do Just a uh, comment on that. I think that, that's an important point that the, um, it, it, it's not uncommon that a faculty member might say, well, when I start a company and it's going to be my former postdoc who, like you say, knows the technology but has no real business background mm -hmm. at all. And, and that's that's going to not end up. It's not going to fly in this kind of situation where a person's going to be. It's going to be equivalent to appearing before investors and trying to pitch your technology. You can't talk about a term sheet or talk about what uh, things that, that you would certainly know as a business person. Then that's, that's a problem. Right. I only raise it to this group because I think there's there's a bit of that that seems to go on where. <coughs> companies are being formed, but the, any business activities is not being put into it. And so that's and that's very much what the review team is looking for: is that business acumen. Um, and this is also not a program to fund uh, a recent MBA grad as the CEO of the company. This is not an experiment to allow them to get their feet wet at, <laughs> at running a business. This is we want a viable business to come out of this technology. Um, so that's our, our hope. So these are the phase one um, <coughs> track A criteria. Uh, they've, mod they've changed a little bit over time, but really what changes is more of how I present the questions. These are the same criteria for the most part, that there's actual proof uh, the project is going to generate something at the end that is sufficient to allow the technology to be licensed out. 
uh, and there's a reason why you think that that's the case. Oftentimes they use the, the phrase meaningful, measurable, and impactful uh, when it comes to that. It's not just that you need to optimize the technology, you need to make it 25% smaller and run 10 times faster, or whatever it is, that the entrepreneur or, smart, or startup company or even some end, end user would, would, would tell you this is what it needs to be the case before I would actually buy it. Having two sentences in your proposal that says, we think if this, because of this discussion, goes a very long way towards making the reviewers understand why you're approaching the project in the first place and, the, and, and whether or not it's actually a good idea. Uh, the, the timeline, phase ones are all one year, and this is again where uh, a track A, is di track A is different than track B. Track A is very focused in terms of, it has to all be within one year, once everyone comes in for $50,000, you have a lot of restrictions on how you can spend the money. Um, track B, if you have a $10,000 project that you want funded because you need to do one quick test and a market assessment on, based on that test, you send it through the process that the institution set up and then maybe you do it that way and maybe it only takes three months. Those sorts of projects are fantastic. fantastic. And I, I am I'm hoping that we see more of that on the track Bs uh, than we have in the past. Everything for track A is, is close to 50,000. Uh, or they, uh, I, I, and two or three are $40,000, and then afterwards they say, oh, we didn't realize we, could, we should ask for the whole amount. And we say, no, no, it's, you asked for 40, so that's for <laughs> um, There's a strong preference for activities to be performed by outside parties. Um, the, again, the idea is you've already taken the tech, the PIs have already taken the technology up to the point where it's at. Now it's time for someone who's good at building prototypes to build the prototype. Not you do it in your lab with your gravity system. Uh, you want to do good, cool research. We want the technology to move out. This is the system that we've set up. It doesn't work in all situations. Um, and frequently, sometimes you have to do stuff inside inside the lab. Um, could be that you, there is literally no other place to build the prototype other than your lab. You make that case in your proposal, and then maybe it gets done. Uh, there has to be a reasonable path to market. So if it's going to cost $20 million to get to market, um, you need to have a sense already of how you're going to raise that $20 million. If it's going to cost $150,000 to get to market, well, that's a whole lot easier to explain. Um, and uh, there has to be some level of IP protection. Uh, typically, it's a patent, uh, but it could, it, so there should be a provisional patent filed. Uh, or it could be copyright for software. Or in certain situations, trade secret is just what seems to make sense for that technology. Uh, the other pieces for track A are, needs to be the, the evaluators try to understand whether or not the it's likely to generate a startup company in Ohio or be licensed to a startup company in Ohio. If it is in a technology area that is great for Silicon Valley or great for Ann Arbor, um, then it's a little bit more of a question of, well, and it's not great for your city or, or, or the state of Ohio, then you have to kind of establish why it is you think it's going to exist as a viable business downstream. Again, it can be nice and fuzzy on track A because you don't really know until after you've done the work that it's actually going to be viable anyway. But the evaluators are looking to understand that you have this vision for it going forward as a company, uh, whether that's creating a new company or going to an established company, uh, to, a, to a young startup company that already exists. Um, the commercial opportunity, if it's going to cost this $100,000, if it's going to cost $100,000 and the actual addressable market is only $200,000 or $500,000, that's not a very good bet for us. We're not looking for, huge, for a, huge, uh, a huge market. We're not looking for a $500 million market that you can get to somehow off of a $200,000 investment. Uh, but we are looking to have some kind of reason, some standard of reasonableness. Um, the evaluators have been quite clear that they don't have a line that they draw on this, but they do look at it. Uh, and then there are various requirements associated with how you use the funds and the budgets. Uh, and just take a look at the RFP or ask questions today, and I'm happy to answer those. It sounds like, if you, in terms of the you know, sort of track A, describing well, how, what is going to be the, uh, the the plan to bring in enough money to get to that next level. But if, you, if it's a, if it's going to be a high number, that's going to be problematic. Yes. Uh, because anyone can say generically, well, I do this and do that. 
uh, unless you have supporting letters, I suppose, from investors. If we see this happen, if this, if this results in this being true, then we would be, we would be excited about participating so we we see it. Right, and you wouldn't be allowed to keep attach the letters, but you could reference them. And so then, if the evaluators thought there was a lot of potential, then they would probably ask for the letters to verify. Uh, but yeah, if you had some letters from <coughs> foundations or for other other sources of, of, of funding for a something that has a big gap, that would probably that would probably help. Again, the 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 a potential that the company that the license the technology. Uh, the way that we are very confident uh, uh, so as the, just the service provider or can be a, a need to be a, a subcontract or do they have to have a budget for, for that, that Really we want the we want the third party to be a, a subcontractor, just a straight up engineering firm to build the prototype uh, or a contractor to contractors to write the software or, or to build the the, the, the GUI or, or whatever it might be. You have to think of the percentages. Okay. So I do I am capping on the track A, uh, no more than 25% of the ask can go towards personnel time at the institution. Really we're not looking to fund PI time in the lab. We're looking to fund all that other stuff. Um, and so that's the reason behind the cap. Um, and on the track B, several of the institutions that we've talked to already have that kind of cap in place for a lot of their innovation funds, where they don't support PI time. They allow grad student time when it makes sense. When they're a directly funded grad student, you have to move them from one project to another. But uh, in general, they've been, they, they also outlaw PI time, uh, which we like. That's what the evaluators will be looking for, what the commission's going to be looking for. Because, again, the PIs, almost 100% almost of the time, are fantastic researchers who are really great at that technology. They are not business people who are able to do what's typically necessary to transform it into a business. And so we, the project should be gearing towards that, and, and we want the money to go out. So, um, we have a couple of those. Kent is one of the only, well, yes, we have, I think, eight right now. Kent State has got one, or, one of those eight uh, converted from a phase one to a phase two. Um, I would like to get a lot more uh, conversions, and that's part of the reason why we're doing the track B, uh, to enable more flexibility, more projects, hopefully then more conversions. Any other questions for track A? So track B, and I really just put this together this week. Um, so this is, there's a, this is not based on the evaluator perspective. This is just me, based upon how I wrote the RFP. Um, so this this slide will probably change as the evaluator builds an actual score sheet. Um, but right now, at a high level, these are the track B uh, criteria. So again, the purpose of track B is to create this pool of funds that will then, in turn, um, support individual projects. And those projects should be similar in terms of what they're trying to do to a track A. Uh, but there's more flexibility and uh, the actual process is different. We're going to evaluate the track B proposal. We're not going to evaluate each one of the projects. Those are just going to be viewed by the committee. So the process, it, you know, how those are actually set up, uh, what level of due diligence has gone into prior to the selection, what is the tech transfer office doing to make sure these are good projects? How do you incorporate jumpstart into the process? Uh, so broadly speaking, again, it's process, the committee membership uh, from being outside, um, deal flow, the dollars have to make sense to how many how many projects you think are actually going to get funded. Um, use of funds, again, PI time is discouraged, really looking for third party vendors still, but again, there's more flexibility on track B than on track A. We don't have a 25% restriction on personnel time, for instance, for each individual project. Um, and then, really, the institution needs to explain how the institution is strong at whatever they're strong at and how they're going to leverage that strength into this process to move technology forward. And whatever flexibility that they want within the program, whether it's small awards, bigger awards, um, minimal ESP engagement, whatever it happens to be, we want to, that, that has to be explained somewhat in the proposal and then in the interview. 
And I don't have exciting pie charts for that because it's not. Uh, so any questions about uh, track B before we go on to track two, uh, phase two? So you didn't mention project management. Uh, you, you, internally, you have the good milestones. And, and uh, I guess. Yes, and that, that is uh, one of the questions is, how, how are you going to manage these projects? Um, so some thought's going to have to go into that. Um, I imagine that the evaluators are going to make sure that there's some some system in place. They're not going to get too much in the weeds. And we can, uh, uh, it's track B, uh, the, the allocation can be a milestone based. It wouldn't have to be a set amount if it's going for the 50,000. If you want to see something first, you put in 10 or whatever. Yeah, actually, that would be fantastic. I'd love to see that. Uh, instead, uh, instead of just a straight award to all the projects, you have milestones, and you know, maybe after milestone three, they, can, they get additional funding. However, whatever makes sense for Kent State to set up in terms of being able to deploy the funds, um, if it's that kind of restriction, maybe it's maybe it's just smaller rewards. That's the exciting experiment part of this. I want you guys to make it make sense for you. As long as you follow the rules there. <laughs> Any other questions on the track view right now? So then phase two, again, the point of phase two is to uh, Really, it's to take a, a alpha prototype and turn it into the beta prototype that investors want to see. Make sure that it actually does the thing that the investors want to see, whether that's um, you know, whatever that happens to be. Uh, so input from downstream investors is critical in any phase two. <coughs> uh, it's designed to fund the project. It's not designed to fund the entrepreneur's time. Uh, in fact, they're not allowed to spend time. They're not allowed to get paid for their time. Uh, so it's even more restricted than phase one, actually, on that, uh, because phase one does have a personnel line item. Uh, phase two does not. It's just equipment, supplies, and purchase services. Um, the, the elements the evaluators are looking for um, is the proof point, the end goal of the project, actually meaningful um, for either create for the for the company. Uh, for for the company to move forward, um, meaning to raise more money or to get to go to market. Three of my phase twos have gone to uh, have been set up around the idea of going to market, not raising additional funds. The rest of them are raising additional funds. Uh, the they look. These are the elements they look at. I'm just not going to read each one. Um, really looking at the business model of the team. Uh, make sure that it's going to happen in a year. Make sure there's IP protection. It's it's all the stuff that I talked about earlier. Um, one thing is an exclusive license with the institution has to be signed within nine months. I'm <coughs> flexible on the nine months. If it's ten months, it's not the end of the world. But if it's going to carry on for two years, there's a, there's an issue because then you know we want these things to go forward. Uh, and then again, budget requirements. Are there. For phase two, the two big fall down points, one of them is the fall down point, it's business model. Um, frequently we get uh, what Paul was talking about, it's a professor who wants to set up a company based around the technology and has no, no experience running a business um, and doesn't even have a business plan when they get into the interview or when they propose. Um, those ones don't get funded. You have to have a business plan before you can, you should have a business plan in hand when you're submitting a proposal. To a fair degree, I would argue that the proposal should be a, a focused version of your business plan. Um, and then proof to raise additional funds is actually the second most often uh, uh, faulted one, but at only 34% of the reds, as you can see, business model is the very big problem that for phase twos. So any uh, questions for phase twos? I figure most of you are actually from Kent, not outsiders, so I figure phase two I can kind of be refunded. <laughs>